Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Profit Minds podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Stephen Kirch, creator of the Profit Minds Growth System, a unique blend of profit growth, productivity acceleration, and building robust business process for scale. In every episode, I interview entrepreneurs and small business owners from around the world with a unique story to tell. You can find the show on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and more. Well, hello, everyone. Today, my guest is Susan Schwartz, founder of the River Birch Group. And today, we're going to be talking about how to use your emotional intelligence to succeed. Welcome, Susan. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So this is the question that I ask all of my guests. Tell us your story. How did you get to be where you are and do what you do? Uh, and, 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 you know, what, what was it that inspired you? Um. Well, that is an excellent question, and it's been a really interesting journey. Um, I started life out as an economics major and a dance minor. Needless to say, it's all about theme and variation and the business <laughs> world, that. and it yep. continues. Um, and I worked in the technical industry as a project manager and uh, worked on huge projects, hospitals and a big, large university. And when I was 27, I decided I deserved a promotion, just like every other 27-year-old. And my boss looked at me and he said, Schwartz, you'll never be a manager. And needless to say, I wasn't thrilled or happy. There were some extenuating thoughts. And I said some things I probably shouldn't have. And one of my very dear friends was in a cubicle right outside that office. And she said, I think we need to chat. So we went outside and walked around the block and walked around the block a second time. I was rah, 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 rah. And finally I stopped roaring and she looked at me and she said, Sue, he's right. It's your attitude, which was just a gib slap. I just, but it not, I mean, she's a very dear friend and it took a good friend to tell that to me. But I did immediately, I started looking at what was wrong with my attitude. And I started watching the people who I respected. Obviously it was not my boss. Otherwise we wouldn't have had that conversation. <laughs> I would have known about it in advance and fixed it a year earlier. But, um, and so I got very involved uh, with leadership and management training and I went, I was working for AT&T, the world's largest company to the world's smallest company. It was a startup. I was employee number 12. Mm. And it was a technology training company. And it was a privilege. I ended up um, being one of the leadership team that took it public. And I worked with all the trainers and all the people issues. And I eventually went into product management, which meant I was looking and working directly with our customers. It was a fabulous experience. And then what all public companies want, somebody bought us. I moved on to a global company where I was responsible for coordinating 20 different training organizations across 10 countries to create wow. a universal um, learning system. And at that point, I realized technology didn't drive business, people did. And I did a quick switch and really focused on the leadership and management part of project management, the people part. And I was teaching the management and leadership curriculum for uh, uh, preparing people for the PMP certification, project management professional. Right. Mm -hmm. One of those four hour tests you only want to take once. <laughs> And I, I didn't really realize it, but I, I knew it once I saw it. I'd have these very, and there was mostly men at that time, really technical folks come in. I pull cable, I flip IP bits, I write code. Who needs this management crap? And sometimes they were more colorful. And during the course, I would ask the question, what makes a good leader? We've already listed all these leaders on the board. 
And I said, well, what's the common thread? What makes a great leader? And every class I'd have somebody say, I know one when I see one. I can't tell you why they're a good leader. I just know it. And at that point, I realized leadership is really intangible. How do you measure humility? How do you measure empathy? And that's when I discovered emotional intelligence. And somebody introduced me to the EQI 2.0 assessment. And that measures takes 15 traits, 15 data points, and the report is in color-coded bar charts. And my technical people, my buddies, loved it because it was data. They could look at it. They could see it. I've started putting it on a normal curve, that statistical curve, so you can see how you balance out because you can't have too much or too little emotional intelligence. You are who you are. It's just like Goldilocks. It's just right. And it's how, and that's what I love doing. That's what I'm doing now is helping people recognize what is their emotional intelligence, um, what are their attributes, what are their strengths, and what are their not so strong traits, and how they can go about being successful by leveraging their strengths. And you might bring somebody on board to your team to help you out in a capacity, or you might call me as a coach, and we can help you work through that. It's interesting that you say that that your emotional intelligence is what it is and it's okay. Mm -hmm. So so um so is it possible to have too much or too little? I mean you you're you're I think you're saying that that everybody has the right amount? Is that well, really what I, is that I what I'm hearing? Say it's not necessarily the question is what is the right amount? Okay. So, so tell me. Well, um, Harvard Business Review last month or two months ago had um, a front page article that said, you can have too much emotional intelligence. And they went through this whole article and it was about a manager who let their people walk all over them. So how the author defined emotional intelligence was empathy. Sure. And there's so much more to emotional intelligence than just empathy. Now, that was poor behavior. That wasn't right. not enough emotional intelligence. That was poor behavior. Or, or letting one aspect of your emotional intelligence rule what it is that you do. Yes. Yes. Is, so, that, is that a better way to describe the, the, the challenge here? So that I love if, it. If, if you're, you know, if you're, you're high on the empathy scale, um, you don't can't, you, you don't want to let it, it doesn't mean that you're going to, going to react with empathy to everybody. It, it's going to feel it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that has to drive your act. Is that? That is exactly right. Okay. That is exactly right. So for example, reality testing is one of those 15 data points. So if you realize that you can empathize too much with people, like all of a sudden you find yourself taking on all of their work and you don't get to do your job till five o'clock because you're doing everybody else's job, then you, the reality testing steps in and you evaluate that situation and respond. In fact, I call emotional intelligence, it's a verb. It's not a noun, it's a verb. Because emotional intelligence is about observing a situation, evaluating the facts that you see in front of you and your experience, and then choosing how you're going to behave. And once you decide how you want to act, what you want that positive outcome to be, how do you collaborate? How do you bring everybody together to create that positive outcome? I mean, a lot of us are independent contributors. Maybe I am the only person. On the other hand, often things are a little more complicated and you have a group of people that need to work together. Yeah, so so I think what this, this Harvard Business Review author was trying to say was that if you let one aspect of your emotional intelligence 
rule how you behave, that that's emotional intelligence gone too far? Um, well, I wouldn't, I'm going to come back and it's okay, letting your emotions take over Okay. for you. But there's, right. because when you look at the EQI assessment tool, there is, uh, there are 15 points. I won't go through all of them, but like there's self-regard, there's self-expression, knowing how you're relating to a situation. What are your thoughts and feelings? So you can address it. How well um, emotional expression, how well, you know, you have your, the company message. How do you align with that message? Then how do you communicate that message? Um, and then you have um, the interpersonal. That's just how you bring the group together. Um, you have stress management because people handle stress differently. And you need to recognize how you handle stress to protect your triggers. But bad things happen. And your team is looking to you to see how they behave. So you have to know how each person on your team reacts. And then there's so, some decision-making stuff. Yeah, going okay. On. All right. So, so is this e EQI test, is that the best way to measure somebody's in emotional intelligence? It is, I'll say one way, because there are several out there and it's the one that I choose to use as the assessment. Okay. There are several out there and um, and every coach uses a platform that they are most comfortable with and that benefits their primary audience, which is, I've, I've learned from some lawyer friends, you say it depends. So. <laughs> okay, so, so can you measure the impact of emotional intelligence and business practice? How do you Absolutely. do that? Absolutely. How do you do that? Well, one is um, anecdotal actions, and then there are really hardcore numbers. So if I can show you both, share both. Sure, sure. When I was teaching that class for project managers, somebody uh, met me. He was the founder and owner of a federal government IT um, subcontractor, federal. I lived in DC until five years ago. Okay. And I met him at an industry event and he said, Susan, your class was my favorite one. That elective was just fabulous. I was like, oh, thank you. I'm not fishing, but could you tell me why? And apparently he was going to fire his admin the day after he left training. We finished on Thursday. He was going to fire on Friday. I was like, oh, my gosh, what did she do? And, you know, he said, well, she didn't steal anything, but she just didn't get it. I was like, get it? What is? What didn't she get? And the reason I went on to tell you was in federal contract IT government subcontractor was there's always stress. There's always something going on. There's always a crisis. And how this gentleman reacted to stress was he would throw his arms in the air and slam the phone down and throw some papers. And he was just very, as we would say, emotional about it. His secretary, his admin, would be nearby. She'd hear what he was going on about, maybe not yelling, but harumphing about. She would head back to her desk very quietly. And before, while he was still throwing his arms around, she had contacted the person that could fix it and had put the solution into practice underway. And he said, you know, I learned that people react to stress differently. And she really was a very good assistant. If I fired her next Friday or this Friday, it's not like I was going to lose any money. So he watched her. He watched her for a week. And he said at the end of that week, he realized how valuable she was. He said, so instead of firing her, I gave her a raise. Huh. So that's, that's the anecdotal part. The real 
business part, um, the Gallup organization has been doing um, a lot of research in how to make the workplace much more productive. And about a year ago, the Surgeon General's office put out a report about mental health and well being in the workplace. It's a great report. I can share it with you, share it mm. with the audience. There are five elements. One of the elements is mattering at work. Isn't that a great word? I was like, what is mattering? And as I did a little bit of research, it's really about respect and mission purpose, which is what I believe emotional intelligence is all about. It's about aligning your mission and being respectful so that you can observe and pull the best out of all of your people. So I started doing some research and what I discovered was Gallup has 12 questions that they talk about engagement. And when employees are not engaged, they leave. There's yep. more absenteeism, there's high turnover, the safety, oh my gosh, I hadn't thought about that. Safety goes down, there's lots of costs there. And just even the productivity. Just, sure. And that's, so- Yeah, that, that that's a leading indicator of, of employee retention is engagement. Right. So the Gallup organization came up with 12 factors that 12 questions that you can ask employees to see how engaged they are. Mm -hmm. And a couple of the questions, I didn't want to mess it up. I wrote them down. Um, one is at work, my opinion seems to count. Okay. Another one said in the last seven days, I have received recognition or praise by doing good work. 36% of the people said that they had never, that they had not received that in seven days. That means that 37% of the people, nobody even said thank you. So if you don't feel, you know, we're not talking about uh, you know, in Little League, these, you know, soccer, where everybody gets a trophy, but just receiving some sort of appreciation for, for yeah. your contribution. So what they recognized is if companies put forth some engagement effort, which doesn't cost any money, if you even say good morning to somebody, if you walk in and say good morning, how are you? That's a, you're recognizing that they are there, your mm -hmm. person. And, you know, even with opinions, if you stop and really listen to somebody's opinion and have that conversation, and I'd say, well, Stephen, I hear what you're saying, but we're not considering X. And that is why I think we need to go in this direction. You still may not like it, but at least I had the conversation. I included right. you. Right. And what they discovered is when managers started behaving differently, they discovered at the end of the year, they were watching several global companies, there was a 22% increase in retention on average, a 31% decrease in absenteeism, and a 12% increase in profits. See, those are hard numbers. Those are all very measurable. Right, the, the impact of people leaving, uh, the impact of their productivity; those are all definitely positive, and of course, it leads to the profit number. Exactly. Yeah. And all it does is, you know, people behaving better, treating others with respect, and and what you know, I. I've had a lot of managers in my career <laughs> and some are better than others. You know, and my kids will call me and I'll be harumphing about their manager. And I said, well, now you know how not to behave when it's your turn to be a manager. But, yeah. and so that's kind of in my practice, I really love working with those rising managers, those people who were subject matter experts, really, really smart, sharp as crayon in the box. And they get promoted because that's the only place to let them get a higher salary. 
And so they get promoted and then they start to fail up. And the, the Peter principle. Exactly. And uh, somebody said, oh, Susan, you're the anti-Peter principle. And I looked at them and I said, oh, my goodness. Bless. <laughs> I grew up in the South. Oh, gosh, bless Peter's heart. He's never been trained. And that's really where I sort of find my mission is helping those people really get from point zero because they're not bad people. A few maybe shouldn't be managers, but most of them are excellent. And, um, or they have the potential to be excellent. Yes. Yes. In fact, I had one um, of my clients uh, was an engineer. And he was so nervous about the promotion. He'd really wanted it. But he was afraid if he asked his manager, who had promoted him, a stupid question, he would be demoted. Mm. So we spent the first month or so working on confidence. And about five months later, his questions were more about how does his voice get heard at the table? He was being invited to the executive committee meetings and representing the engineers. And all the VPs except one, when it had to do with the engineers, directed their questions to him. One VP refused to acknowledge him. They would ask the question of his boss. And then his boss would look around and say, John, what do you think? And it just made him crazy. And I said, you know what? Let's reassess. I, I would have waited to like eight or nine months, but let's see where you've come. And talking about data points, when his assertiveness was in the very lower engagement range, after our five months and mostly building his confidence, he did all the hard work. All of a sudden, it was in the very high range. His points, his uh, score increased by 52 points. It was, I mean, you saw the behavior, but the assessment is the data. Right. Quantifies the, I assume this is like out of 100, right? There's something like that, right? There's a, there's out of well, 50, you said 52 points, is that? Yeah. Well, it's, it's based on a statistical standard deviation. Oh, okay. So that's, again, when we talk about you can have too much emotional intelligence or too little, it's not 9,400 to 100 is an A. It's all relative. So. Okay. 100 means average. It's, you know, the normal curve ah, okay. with the sure. center point. So what he, I mean, it's always a balance. Sometimes having lesser engagement with another strong, heavy engagement balances you out. So okay. my example, I loved being a product manager was for that startup company. My very favorite job ever. And what I realized, because when I first assessed, my e, um, impulse control was on the lower end. And I was like, what? I, I'm very risk averse, what? And then I looked and my reality testing was relatively high. So what happened is I had to think of all these great thoughts. It was a startup. I had 90 days to build it, 90 days to make a profit. So I had to know my customer and then I had to figure out, well, how can I get them what they need for the mini, mini budget that I had? And that's what made my product successful. So in that case, it worked to my benefit. And you know, I call that the jumping off the bridge. I think about it, but I know it'll hurt, so I don't. And, and so that's a and that's why I say you can't have too much or too little. You are who you are. And it's recognizing that maybe I need to take two breaths as opposed to zero breaths before I make a decision. So, so how, how does somebody start to enhance their emotional intelligence? You know, it's really easy. You start to pay attention. Just, hmm. you just look, look and look and watch, observe and listen. Just like the um, president of that IT subcontractor, 
if you just take a step back and observe what's going on, then you will start to understand maybe some alternatives that you can think about applying to that. But it's really about paying attention. That's it. You don't have to go to class. You don't have to take an assessment. If you just stop and pay attention, that's you're taking a huge step. Interesting. So, so um, I understand you wrote a book about I this. I did write a book. Uh, um, and, and you're working on a next edition, right? I, the publisher asked me to write a, another edition. Since this was written, oh goodness, in 2017, it got published officially in 2018. It's called Creating a Greater Whole, A Project Manager's Guide to Becoming a Leader. And so it's uh, an introduction. I had uh, people in my project management curriculum, I wrote an elective called Emotional Intelligence for Leaders. And they said, Susan, this is great. Will you make us an advanced one where we can learn more about people and managing people better? It's like, great. We had a focus group, told us what, you know, what they wanted. We wrote a couple courses. We ran the betas. Just bare minimum of people came. And I used to be in sales. So I picked up the phone. I called everybody in the focus group. And to a T, their response was, well, my manager will pay for technical training. Soft skills are easy. Buy a book. And I got mad and wrote a book. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that that just goes to show the lack of emotional intelligence, or maybe I should say the lack of reality checking uh, for those for those managers. <laughs> right. It's not a lack of emotional intelligence. It's a lack of, you know, hey, um, reality will tell you something. Yeah. Pay attention. Uh, You'll pay attention it's right in front of your face. Yeah. Because you need to know not just what you're feeling. There is important to reflection, but I think a really successful business person recognizes and stops to look at what other people are thinking so they can choose to behave with, um, I guess, effectively, not to use effective too many times. There is one prompt that I offer people. When you're in a meeting, are you thinking about what the other person wants to achieve? Could be your client, your boss, or are you thinking about what you want to achieve? If you only think about yourself, how successful will you be? If you hear what the other people need and you know what you want, you might be able to get in with a win-win solution. And, um, and that's where I think emotional intelligence really plays into successful business. That's great. So Susan, if somebody wants to reach out to you, somebody wants to, 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 get in touch with you, find out more about you and your programs and, and what you do. Uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, the best, my email is sgs at the riverbirchgroup.com. That's river, B-I-R-C-H, group, like the tree. And I am on LinkedIn. I publish pretty frequently, I post. So you'll be able to find me on LinkedIn. That's great. And that concludes our show. Thanks to my guest, Susan Schwartz, the founder of the River Birch Group. I hope you learned something about how to use your emotional intelligence to succeed. I know Thank I you. did. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Profit Minds podcast. This is your host, Dr. Stephen Kirch. Please visit www.profitminds.net for other episodes or to contact me. Thank you for your positive feedback, comments, questions, and for sharing this show with others. Thanks for listening. Have a grateful day.